Father, we thank you for the enabling grace you give us every day to come before your throne of grace, to receive grace for help in time of need. We thank you for Brother Samuel and Prophet Rolanda and all the team that pray on Fridays. We ask you, Lord, strengthen everyone with your own mind. Let your spirit help us to apprehend the things about the end of the age that will act as guideposts so that we will not walk in darkness according to your word. We bless you for answering our prayer. To you be all honor and glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Men and brethren, we thank the Father today for his goodness and his mercy. And we're grateful that by his grace, um, my daughter prays. Um, to, uh, today is her off day in school and she's available to do the recording. And we thank the Father for what he's doing. Pastor Grace tonight, today marks 22 years of our union. For his own glory and purpose, we married on 30th November 1996, four days after my 40th birthday. And if you are one of those people who, like me, you are past 30 and it looks like your generation has all married, relax. There is someone the Father has for you. Relax. It's all about destiny fulfillment. It's not about the things and fantasies of people. And so, 40 days I mean, four days after my 40th birthday, is the miracle happened. And we thank the Father for what he's done by himself in this period of time. We thank him for what he's yet doing and what he will yet do. I want to say to you all, by the grace of the Lord, will I breach this cause today and conclude it, so to say, and then release some of the, you know, a few more issues of teaching notes uh, the one about the Antichrist, we posted two as at this morning remains one to be posted. And then we post this one's message. What we'll do today, as the Lord leading me to share with us, is to give you a biblical narrative about the end of the age. What are the things the Lord says will occur? How will it pan out? And there are a number of things the Lord says to remind us of. Some we have already discussed that, number one, there will be a redefinition of the gospel. And what you have is predominantly religion in different ways. The right to the left, not the gospel of the kingdom. Diversions. Diversions can never lead you to your destination. So, that is what's happening. He said, people shall define their own gospels and do whatever they want. Number two, the world... In the world, while the church is out of the way, in the world, iniquity will abound. And as it abounds, there will be, people will find new ways to express their distaste with Elohim and their rejection of his own value system. The culture of the kingdom will be rejected by the world. There will be no more pretense. It will be off, you know, and you're going to find it in various ways. Some of this we had covered before. Number three. The covenant of peace for one between the person who will be the Antichrist and Israel, whereby he will be the Lord protector of Israel, not Elohim. Okay? You know, there was a man who lived in this land called Oliver Cromwell. His title was Lord protector of the commonwealth. He they offered him to be king and he declined. He refused to be king. He became the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. So a man will emerge will be the Lord Protector of Israel. They won't know Elohim. They won't. They will know a man. But more importantly, this man is going to help Israel to make the thing that has eluded it since 1948. Peace with Palestinians, peace with Arabs, peace with Islamic world. Something that will be hailed widely as a mother of all peace agreements. And Israel will relax and feel as safe. Remember what we said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I mean, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Remember what it says. When they shall say peace and safety. He says it's a time to be careful because sudden destruction may well be coming. Then number four thing, we have also discussed two days ago, the rapture of the saints, swift, sudden, is gone in a moment of time. Those who were earnest in the Lord, who took their uh, assignment seriously, they will be 
taken out of the way, but before they are taken out of the way, the dead in Yeshua will rise first. Okay, then they will be caught up with him. And what next? Number five, the judgment seat of Yeshua. You find this in Second uh, Corinthians 5.10. We shall appear at the judgment seat of Yeshua. That's what Paul referenced. Now look, what is left for me? Listen, he said, Timothy, I've done my own work. I've finished my race. What is left for me is a crown of righteousness which the Lord will give me and is appearing. So the judgment seat of Yeshua is the next thing for the saints who went up to the rapture and the resurrection. The judgment seat of Yeshua on earth will be number uh, 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 16, manifestation or unveiling of the Antichrist. That will be number 6. And that will be on earth. And the Antichrist will ascend and begin to rule. It wouldn't be known before then. It will be now known then. And we say, as we told you two days ago, in the state of chaos, or yesterday, the state of chaos all over the world, with the rapture of saints, pilots who are, who are in the Lord, living, planes beat out. And even some airlines have begun to, if they see a Christian pilot, they put a pilot, a co-pilot who is not a Christian. You know, and they're trying to do all these kind of worldly things. But this Antichrist will bring some semblance of order to the world. And then that will lead to the next thing that will be the big news, which is number seven. The abomination of desolation that Yeshua referred to in Matthew 24, 15, and Daniel referred to in Daniel chapter 9. The, man, the, the abomination of desolation is the defiling of the temple. If it is so, then it means that the third temple will surely be built. Most likely everything has been assembled. As we all know, everything means everything. It is even believed by some that using precast construction te technology, the Temple Institute and its sponsors may well be building every single component of the temple. It is possible. It is possible that what will now happen will be assembling what has been already precast. Israel, Israel is uh, expert, world expert in precast building. So that would be something of a matter of short space of time, and the temple is there. The sacrifices will resume. Are they to Elohim? No. Even though you may hear the word God in the Bible, they were just talking in terms of what people would think they'll be doing. Since the sacrifice of Yeshua at the cross, there's no more there's no more sacrifice. That was one acceptable sacrifice for all. But the key is, the, is to now understand that the Antichrist, who would have played a role, of course, in building that temple, either by assuring them to go ahead to build, guaranteeing them that security of that place, when they build it, one day he will enter and say, yes, I'm your protector. I am your savior. I am your Elohim. And that would be the defiling by offering himself at the altar that he is Elohim of Israel. Of course, the people will refuse, they will reject. And having refused and rejected, that would lead to number eight, the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is a time in world history when the Antichrist will rule the world with his own standard. His own standard, his own jaded wisdom will be in there. It will be a rule that will cover three sets of people. One, Christians who miss the rapture. Christians who miss the rapture are going to be tormented because they defile grace and didn't take grace. They will still, if they are among the number that will be saved, they will make it, but it will be by martyrdom as we've told you. So people will be beheaded, people will be dragged in the street, people will be mauled, people will be tormented, and their own relatives will mock them and even give them up. It will be a great, terrible time for any Christian that misses the rapture. But those who teach that no Christian will be saved after the rapture is erroneous. Is in the Bible very clearly that people will be saved during that period. And so, apart from them, the other people will be the Israel, Israel and the Jews across the world. During the Great Tribulation will be a terrible time. You see, Every opinion poll that has been done shows that anti-Semitism is on the rise. 
there's this suspicion and suspiciousness of Jews. Everything that happens is them. If banks have issues, it's them. Because why? They are the ba- they own the banks. They own the media. So as you're talking about fake media, eventually it will come to demonization of the Jews all over the world. People think the media is not fair. It pushes its own interests. All of them, all the areas that they are uh, leaders in, will be demonized. And during the Great Tribulation, to be a Jew, it will be a terrible thing. Jeremiah said it. It's time of Jacob's trouble. Yeshua said it would be a time of Great Tribulation, none as the world has ever seen. It will be a terrible time. Yeshua said it in March 24. Then the other people who are going to live in the Great Tribulation era is the people, you know, that are also called the unbelieving world. Amen? Amen? Those who are on Facebook Live and on Daybreak, are we streaming well? Is it is it appearing well? Amen? Okay. For the unbelieving world, it will be a time of terrible. The world will descend into the morass of darkness because the light of the church being taken away There'll be no more moral restraint. People are going to do their thing anywhere, anytime, anywhere, anyhow. People are going, you are going to find all kinds of things on the road, on the street. This idea of people going to rent a secret place to go and commit immorality, for instance, that restraint will be off because there'll be nothing to restrain people. Everything, negative behavior will be at the extreme. And that is also the time of the judgments. The judgments are going to be coming upon the earth. Yet the people will not repent. We know about the sealed judgments of Revelation chapter 6. The sealed judgments of Revelation 6. And that include war and conquest. Okay? By the white horse. False, you know, false peace. Then there will be the red horse, which will be implied peace. We drop from the earth and the spirit of killings unleashed. In that same Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 to 6, the black horse, which will signify famine and extreme poverty on a global scale. scale. Revelation 6, 7, and 8, the pale horse, which will signify death and hell unleashed. And one quarter of the human beings, one quarter of the population on earth, right now the earth is about eight point something billion, one quarter is about two billion, will be wiped out. David Wilkerson of Blessed Memory of Times Square Church, he says in one hour, I think he preached a message about one hour, men and brethren, one quarter of the world will be wiped out. In that Revelation 7, F6, 7 to 8. Then we also see that if you look at that time, you see that the pale horse, death and hell unleashed, edge, you know, wiped away by wars, crises, hunger, strange deaths, you know, and attacks by wild animals. Then verse 9 to 11 of Revelation 6 of the comfort for the tribulation saints, divine comfort for them. To relax, it's almost going to be over because those who be saved then will think that will this thing never end? And the Lord will reassure them it will end. You see, it's full of mercy, men and brethren. Then we see in verse 12 to 17, stars from, from the fall from the earth, fall upon the earth from heaven. Stars will be falling. You've seen people talk about Omoma, the star that is streaming towards the earth looking like a, you know, the head of a serpent or whatever. Can you imagine stars falling upon the earth? Oh, men and brethren, we're told that heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. Mountains and islands will be supernaturally moved. Mountains and islands, whether it will be by tsunami or whatever, we're not told here. Now, there will be great terror upon the earth rim. The Revelation chapter 8 will deal with the trumpet judgments. We need to read all of it. I want to say this to you. If you have been tired of the book of Revelation, the guideline we're going to give today for you will give you clarity. So the trumpet judgments will begin and you'll begin to see. If you read it then, you see chapters 9 and 
If you note verse 6, verse 13 to 21, and the 200 man army, 200 million man army, well, as we told you the other day, we're not sure. We said only that Chinese can feel 200 million people in an army. But then it could also signify supernatural beats. If you look at what it says, Let, let's see it real briefly and see what it says there so that we can, we can decide whichever one the Lord will lead us. Okay? It says, Revelation chapter 9. In verse 13, the sixth angel sounded and had a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before Elohim, saying to the sixth angel, which had a trumpet, lose the four angels that are bound to the great river Euphrates in modern day Iraq, Euphrates, Babylon. Okay, then what happened to them? We're told, and the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men, the third part, one third of those who are alive. And the number of the army of horsemen were 200,000 thousand, that is 200 million. And I had the voice of, I had the number of them. Then it, then it went on. And then talked about verse 17. Talking about some supernatural beings, men and brethren. If you look at this thing, it's terrible. In Revelation 11, it goes on. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of Elohim, and the altar, and them that dwell, worship therein. Look at verse 2. And they cut, which is without the temple, live out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be trod upon foot forty and two months. Now this is something that sounds strange, but this thing, you have no idea what this means. This thing tells us something. The dome on the rock, the Muslim shrine, the third holiest in Islamic history, where it is right now, and people go and bow their hair, bow their hair and say they are wailing, it's the wailing wall. People who have studied the Bible are certain that the temple of Solomon was not there. That was the fort of Antonio. The fort of Antonio is where you have the dome on a rock now. And you know what? They said that if you take a comparison, what happened when the captain took the soldiers and ran down the stairs to rescue Paul, who was to be lynched in the temple? They've located where those stairs are and where the colonnade is, and where the temple ought to be. So in other words, this place is, be, is the place that could have been regarded as the court of the Gentiles, where the dome on the rock is. In other words, what this means, if you get this very well and contemporize it, means that the temple was situated in a place that is not the dome on the rock. In other words, the temple can be built without World War happening. You have no idea what this means. He said, don't measure. It's been given to the Gentiles who have possession of that place. In other words, where they build the temple is free. Then if you look at Revelation 12, read it all. Revelation 13 talks about the Antichrist and the false prophet, which we showed you yesterday. Revelation 14 tells us about the special company of the elect who are never defiled in any way never defiled. They kept themselves. And by His grace, He has a special place for them. The Revelation 16 tells us about the vile judgments. Judgments that were released through vials. Revelation 17 is continuation of the vile judgment. And if we had time, Revelation 17, we we'll read three verses of Scripture, 12 to 14, what it says in Revelation chapter 17. Look at what the Bible tells us there. And it's an interesting read. Revelation 17, 12 to 14. And the ten horns, which thou sowest, are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. They receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. They have one mind. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, 
For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. Take note of those three words. Called, chosen, faithful. Men and brethren, many are called. But you know what? Few are chosen. Then among the few chosen, very few are still maintain their faithfulness unto the end. So the qualification for those who would make it is stated right here. You are called, you are chosen, and you receive grace to remain faithful to the very end. Better brother, this is so important. Then, when, um, the, 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 the ninth thing that will happen while these things are going on, the great tribulation, shortly before the great tribulation actually is executed, there's something Elohim will do. And that is in Revelation chapter 7. He will seal the remnant of Israel. Those he has specially ordained to be preserved no matter what. So that the lineage of Abraham will always have people who are part of him. And let's see what he says about them. Revelation chapter 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four wings of the earth, and the wind shall not blow, that the wind shall not blow on the earth, nor in the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel descending from the east, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in their foreheads, and had a number of them which were sealed. And they were sealed, and hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel, specially sealed, preserved from the woe that will come upon the earth. Elohim preserved them. Can you imagine the millions in Israel? Six point something million. The millions across the world. Maybe another eight to ten million. 144,000 will be preserved specially by divine election. So, the Lord is still in the business of preserving those who he is in covenant with. Then the other thing that will happen is number 11, the number, um, number 9 is marriage supper of the Lamb. You find that in Revelation 19. Marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember, we said that the at the beginning of the seven-year period, the rapture will take place, and all those who made it will be seeing the glories of heaven. They've heard about heaven all their life. They see the glories of heaven, just you know, just kind of uh, taking it all in, and then the marriage supper of the Lamb is what you find in Revelation chapter nineteen. It is the day when. Great things will happen. Revelation 19. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our Elohim. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he had judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and had avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Again he said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rise up forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped Elohim that sat on the throne, saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Amen! Hallelujah! And the voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our Elohim, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And had as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord Elohim omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, 
These are the true sayings of Elohim. The true sayings of Elohim. These are true sayings. They have a married supper of the Lamb. Those who triumph, who were raptured of, out of this earth, those who are resurrected out of this earth, he says, they will have a banquet for them in the courts of heaven where they reunite with their head, Yeshua. The marriage of the Lamb is something that everybody on earth and everybody who is in Yeshua needs to make sure that you lay hold of grace and make it to there. Because that's a great thing. Then after the marriage supper of the Lamb, brethren, the times of the Gentiles will come with their siege on Jerusalem to see whether they will destroy Jerusalem utterly. And this is one of the things that will occasion the second return of Yeshua, which you find in Revelation chapter 19. Yeshua will be coming for a number of reasons on earth. One, he'll be coming to establish the kingdom, but before the kingdom is established, he had to deal with the rebellion of men, and the princes of the earth will have massed their army to destroy Jerusalem, and because of his covenant with Israel, remember, he's the king of the Jews, he will also come to save them. So, some things will happen. I want you to read Revelation chapter 19. After the marriage supper of the Lamb, I want you to see what it says here. Okay, from verse uh, uh, to, uh, verse 11. And I saw heaven open. And behold a white horse. And he that sat thereupon. Was called faithful and true. That's Yeshua. Brothers and sisters. Unfaithfulness has become a norm today. Spouses. Friends. You know. People being unfaithful to visions, unfaithful to people they are coming, supposed to be committed to having covenantal relationship. Unfaithfulness is something. It can start little, but it's something. But one of the names of Yeshua, one of his titles is faithful and true. What you see is what you get. There's no secret part, compartment in his mind or heart that you don't see. He is committed, he's committed. And men and brethren, this is something we need to take. You know, this morning the Lord will just remind me how some people he connected us with in 1996 we remained in excellent relationship till now. You know what? It's faithfulness. Men and brethren, for you to be able to know there are people the Lord connects to you. You don't take it for granted. You don't betray it. You don't act unseemingly. You do what the Lord wants you to do to build up their lives. Now, his name is faithful and true. Let's see what he says here. He was, he says, his eyes, oh sorry, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And his head, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of Elohim. Capital, the Word of Elohim. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Armies on heaven followed him, clothed in white, in linen, fine linen, white and clean. Let me say something before we go ahead. When I was before the Lord some years ago, when he gave this, oh, it was like light bulbs popping up inside my spirit man. And I understood what the Lord meant by this. That those who follow Yeshua from heaven to come and fight the armies of the Antichrist are not angels, are not archangels. It's those who were raptured. But those resurrected, those who were raptured after the judgment seat of Yeshua, the marriage supper of the Lamb, they will come back with him to heaven to execute the ordinance of Elohim upon the earth rim. To execute Psalm 2 upon the earth rim. He's going to be, look at what the Bible describes him. He says, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothing fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations. He should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treaded the wine press of the fierceness of the rod of Almighty Elohim. And he sat he had on his vesture and on his thighs, his vesture, on his clothing and on his thighs, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why is that name? 
because he shall have no rule alone. He will not be the Lord alone. He has co-heirs with him. He has co-rulers with him in the millennial reign that is to come. And those people are people who were redeemed by the blood and were faithful in their assignments, took their assignments seriously and executed it with everything in them. And he will give them their crowns. And some people will rule over ten cities or five cities or one city. You remember that parable? There will be rule of this earth by those who overcame. Not the tribulation saints. The tribulation saints, when they are killed, they will go, they are, their souls will go to the altar to wait for the day when they will be reunited with him. And then the Bible, the king of king Lolo, and I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great Elohim, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and the flesh of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both fresh, free and born, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, the Antichrist. This is the battle of Armageddon. It's also mentioned in Revelation 16, but it's now explained here that Yeshua will return and these people will gather against Jerusalem. Yeshua will lead the armies of saints triumphant and they will overcome and defeat the army of the Antichrist and the false prophet with him, the captains of the generals of the nations. Of course, this will be the most choicest war. You saw the early allied powers of the world war. You saw the central powers. You saw those powers, those alliances that were made. Yeshua will return with those who he redeemed out of the earth. And they, the whole armies of the earth, communist, democratic, you know, capitalist, socialist, their armies will march to say, let's blot out Israel. Let's take it out permanently. These people are the cause of all the trouble on earth. At that moment, the king of the Jews will appear. He came as a lamb, rejected. He's going to come in fullness of power and authority. So the beast was taken. With him, the false prophet, verse 20, the wrong miracles before him, which which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, they were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Men and brethren, so we see that if you look at number 12, the second coming of Yeshua, he will execute judgment upon the Antichrist and the false prophet, he will rout the army, and then something will happen. And that's in in number 14, because the final battle of Armageddon, Yeshua will emerge victorious with uh, all those he sends who made it with him. And that will lead us to Revelation 20, which is item number 14, the binding of Satan by one angel. To the many people are praying, I bind you, Satan, cast you into the bottomless pit. If you pray that prayer, he knows you don't know what you are saying. He knows you're a babe. A day will come, only one angel. For now, Satan has legal license to walk about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So when it comes to you, the Bible says, resist him steadfastly in the faith, he will flee for you. Submit yourself to Elohim, resist him, he will flee. So don't give him any space. You know what? He will keep roaming. But a day will come, Revelation 20, and I saw an angel come down from heaven. You see, the angels didn't come with Yeshua. It is us, the redeemed who come down with him. But now, an angel will now come from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were fulfilled, and after that he will lose a season. So we are told here that the millennial reign to start, Satan will be bound for a thousand years so that there will be no evil influence on the earth because the millennial reign will be a time of universal righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It will be a time where holiness will be the order of the day. There will be nothing in any way to try to tempt anybody's flesh. No. Because we are going to see life as it was on earth before Adam and Eve fell out of the way. How they live before. No death, no terrorism, no plane crash, 
no terrorism, I mean, no evil, no nothing negative. The millennial reign will be a continuation of that which Elohim instituted when he opened your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. The kingdom of heaven is still on the earth. The kingdom that was lost is the time of recovery of the kingdom. And Yeshua will rule it as king of kings and lord of lords. You and I, according to whatever the Lord deems our work to be, at the judgment seat of Yeshua, it will be not a judgment for sin, but a judgment for how did you use your gifts? How did you use your calling? Did you build according to pattern? And those who really did it rightly, they will be given great responsibilities on earth and they will rule over people group. And now listen, we, we don't have time to get into it, but at the point where Yeshua will return and the millennial reign will be answered, people will not be killed. Rather, they will be like you have today, amnesty. If you live in this country about 14 years as an illegal alien, undictated, that number of years you live, I don't know whether it's 10 to 14 years or 10 years or so, if you lived up to that, nobody dictated, you get amnesty, they process you, they make you a citizen. So the people of the world will get a pass into the millennium. They will be killed. And who will rule over them? Those who were born again and lived in the strength of the anointing upon their lives and they were able to fulfill the law of Elohim. That's why we know the kingdom now because the time will come when we will rule over people who don't know about the kingdom and we will rule them in righteousness as priests and kings unto our Elohim. And then to let you know that it is them that the, that, that free pass given to them, they'll be tried because we're told in Revelation chapter uh, 7, and after, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from Elohim out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, look at that. Now, after Yeshua has reigned on this earth for a thousand years, Satan is now loosed again. He'll go out and he'll be able to deceive some nations. Why would he be able to deceive them? Because these people were not, they were not, they didn't willingly receive the Lord made a decision and stayed in him before they died. They got a free pass into that millionaire reign. Now they'll be tested because everything in the kingdom needs to be tested. Satan will be loosed. Now you were, Yeshua was your king for a thousand years. And you see what? Some people will still succumb to Satan. He's not talking about those who were born again because when they're born again, your judgment has been put on Yeshua at the cross. You receive the righteousness of the Father in him. It is people who got a free pass into the millennium, like in China, like in the Islamic nations of the world, like in the communist nations of the world, socialist nations, and the Western nations, of course. All these people who we would have ruled over as priests and kings, they'll be tested, and some will still succumb. Then after that, from verse uh, 11, the great white throne judgment. All who died without Yeshua will assemble where the judge of the whole earth will try them. The sea will give up the dead. Those who died in plane crashes, in mountain ranges, they'll be resurrected to face the great white throne judgment. You see that in Revelation chapter 20 from verse 11. And anyone, we are told that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire and those who rejected the love of Elohim, rejected his grace, will miss it forever, forever. And then chapter 21 and chapter 22 tells us about eternity, endless eternity, the eternal phase, not the millennial reign, which was a picture. Now forever and ever, those who made it by his grace are going to enjoy the presence of the Father. They are going to the mystery of Elohim, will be accomplished, according to Revelation 10, 7. So, everything he did, everything about Elohim that's still a mystery right now, because no matter what we know, what we know is still a big, a tincture of the whole. The mystery of Elohim will be accomplished, and there will be no more 
anybody, teaching anybody to know Elohim because everyone shall know him. And that will be endless eternity. Men and brethren, what I've just given you is a framework from now till that time. And when the teaching note is released today, I want you to study it. This is the Father placing a compass in your hand. And you. And the idea is not that this is definitive. It is to provoke you to go and study what you used to be afraid of. The book of Revelation, you see how it makes meaning. How is when these things are broken down, you see that it's so easy, so light. It's not all complicated. It's just a matter of approaching it with open heart like a baby. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world where people are very funny. One day, they are with you. The other day, they are not just not with you. They unleash all the hoizas, all the shells. They want to destroy you utterly. You love people, do them good, and all they are thinking is the day they are going to hit you. Ben and brethren, be sure of this one thing. The end of the age is coming. We are right in the end of time. I want to encourage you to be faithful. Hold fast what you have. Hold fast, brothers and sisters. The Father is with you. His grace is unleashed to us. By His grace, we can hold on. By His grace, we can press in. By His grace, we can make it. It's not by power. It's not by might. He who called us does not abandon us in the middle of an ocean. But He releases grace. The Bible says He giveth more grace. How do we receive more grace? When we are humble before Him, when we pray, when we exercise faith, we can receive grace for every phase of our life. Every chapter of our life, we can receive grace to remain in Him and to be found in Him. Listen, brethren, the end of all things is at hand. Don't be found on the wrong side of the rot of Elohim. If you see what is written in the book of Revelation, the kind of rot that He will unleash upon the earth, you will know it's better to make it one time with the sound of the trumpet. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your loving kindness. We give you all the praise for what you've done. Have your way. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. And so brothers and sisters, we want you to just by his grace, um, remember us in prayer 22 years and counting. Just remember us in prayer. Amen. Those on daybreak, are you still on the line? Amen. I think the line is connected. I think our line is connected. Praise.